Hey you, wherever you are in the world right now, thank you so much for being here with me. We know that we're living in some crazy times and we know that the world is changing. So let's create a bridge as we travel through one another's countries, removing all the labels and coming together as one people, finding our home in one world. And as we do this, this is why our signature talk today is so important. And today I have the privilege and honor to share with you my guest speaker, Jay Winslow. Hi, Jay. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Jay actually is a business owner, master brandologist, and she builds a business and, and life with soul. So basically she's connecting that soul piece with your life, which is amazing. She has uh, done a lot of work with corporations, uh, logos, packaging. She published articles, blogs, has a book, and has been recognized in a top 100 coaching listing, along with Tony Robbins and Martha Beck, um, who have also worked with, and she's also worked with Fortune 100 startups and continues to engage her skills. You have such an extensive resume, but I think, Jay, what I really love about your story is your personal story that you bring to the table, because that backstory that you have is what has enriched your life so much to give the resume that you have, the journey that you've been on to get to where you are today. So I'm really excited to bring you into this platform with me and share your story with the world. As we do this interview today, we know that uh, the world is really in this tangled web of mess with the global pandemic. Um, we're you know, still navigating our way through some darkness and this dark space that the world is living in. And I think every single person goes through different circumstances in their life that they have some identity to or connectedness to navigating some spaces that are uncomfortable and you know aren't always easy, right? So for you personally, what would you say that would have been for you? My goodness. Well, <clears throat> it definitely began when I was much younger. Um, you know, I think there are some people who navigate through the world and they don't really hit any bumps along the road until later in life. And they'll, they've had an idyllic childhood of hay rides and I, I don't even know, ice cream and, you know, I don't know, <laughs> fairy tale kind of stuff. And um, in some ways that should have been what was going on for me, but it, it was not. I, I grew up in a, in what, um, what I now know it was a very toxic environment. And by that I meant, I mean that I just, I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel safe at home and I didn't feel safe at school. Um, one of the things that I used to do when I was younger is I would hide <laughs> I never told anybody this, I don't think, like in the world. <laughs> but I would hide in my, I wonder if, who else does this, but I would hide in my mom's car. Like who would look in, who would look in the car? And because no one was yelling there, no one was screaming at me and I wasn't being told I was doing anything wrong. And, you know, no one else was getting yelled at. And I would hide in the car and I would uh, play Carol King. This is way back in the day. I would play Carol King and James Taylor and Elton John music endlessly, and I would cry and sing, and, and it really helped me. So, but how um, old? How old for you? I think you know. Um, I think a lot of this for me sort of became um, sort of soul crushing. I, I mean, there were a lot of incidents when I was younger. I, I mean, some of them seem so innocuous if they're just taken as one event but when you string them all together it was just like I was exhausted you know by the time I was like seven um like I remember I remember when I was in first grade and in first grade we were learning about clouds and to this day I can't tell you the right clouds and I and the teacher would say okay so you are gonna tomorrow you're gonna tell us what what the clouds are so when you're on your way to school you better 
figure out what those clouds are because we're going to talk about it. And I would be on the school bus, like hyperventilating, like freaking out, like, oh my God, is that a serious cloud? Is that a cumulus cloud? Like what? Oh my God. And, you know, and I would get to school and she would say, okay, what kind of cloud is that? And I would say it would be the wrong cloud. And this was just like, so just this alone was just like, oh my God. And um, so there were a number of incidents like this. I know this sounds goofy, but like when you stack all of them together, there was just so much anxiety and so much stress all the time. And now I see, now that I have decades to look back on and other stories and other education, now I see that I was and still am a very, if not overly sensitive human. It's one of my strengths. I'm an overly sensitive human. I can pick up things that other people don't pick up, which is awesome and great for my work. And then on the other hand, one of my curses is I'm an awesomely sensitive human. Like this bites me in the, you know what, in the keister all the time. So, so many of our strengths are also our weaknesses, but it depends on then what we do with that. Well, what I did with that as an introvert, as a shy, nervous, scared, anxious human was put it all inside, bottle it all up and kind of drive myself. If someone else wasn't driving me crazy, I was driving me crazy. Right. And now we know statistically and through quantum physics and energy and all this scientific stuff that by the time we're about 9, 10, 11, we are being taught how not to think, how not to be creative, how not to trust ourselves, how to tell ourselves no 9 million times a day. Don't touch that. Don't do that. Don't think that. Don't dream this. Don't. We, it's, it's dizzying. But when you're a kid, you just know there's, there's got to be something wrong with me because I'm not like everyone else. And it's, it's, horrific. it's horrific. It was really hard. It was really horrific. And I'm laughing about it, but not in like, it's funny, but it's just in like, holy moly society. What the heck? Yeah. And we don't have any compassion for these little people. And I think also we're not able to, I couldn't express any of this when I was a kid. I couldn't because I didn't have an awareness of it. Now I have this outside of my body view of it. But when you're in it and when you're immersed in it, it's, it's awful. It's, it's not fun. So that's where that, that's what I mean by difficult, toxic. Yeah. So you're going, you're going through this period of time in your life where you're in this toxicity and you're feeling that and you're rejecting it and the way you're rejecting it looks different. You know, like you said, it, it's showing up differently. And as a highly sensitive person, as you pointed out, it could look like there's something wrong with you, yeah. but really it is a gift. It is, there's nothing wrong with you. I mean, you, you have this sensitivity and you are able to pick up on these things but it really is a gift. So if you were to, if you were to go back to your little girl in that moment in time, what would you tell her today? I would tell her as I would tell I'm going to cry now. Um as I would tell anyone whether they're 9, 11 or 111. Like who you are is perfect. And you're a very special human. And you're not here by accident. And um, you actually have incredible gifts that you will be sharing with the world. And I want to invite two things. I want to invite you to always feel safe with me. And if it's not me, find someone that you can feel safe with. And um, please step into that because the longer we push it away, which I did for a very long time, the longer we push this away, um, the harder it gets, the darker it gets, the more disconnected from ourselves we get. Now, I will also tell you that every one of those steps forward, backward, sideways is also perfect. Like it all it's hard to imagine and it's hard, like I could never have imagined in my dark days where my only, 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 only dream, 
only, only dream was to die in a fatal car accident because I was too chicken off myself, myself. I spent so much energy on that dream. And when I found this other path and it disappeared like that, it just went away because suddenly I was thrust into this new dream that you have to please, please, please trust and know, even though you, even though right now your knowing is that the best out would be out, there really is this incredible, incredible life on the other side, as crazy as that seems. And believe me, I get it because it's great, great, crazy. <laughs> the other side is like this beautiful, I like my visual, I use, I used to love, 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 and I still do, the Wizard of Oz. And it kind of reminds me of when they come through the forest and they come to the Emerald City and before them is this like beautiful, it's this beautiful field of poppies and flowers and, and honest to Pete, that's what life really is. Like it's this beautiful field. And we don't, we're like stepping on thorns and we're missing the damn flowers. That there's so much I could say to all of that, because I think you're totally on point as far as if you could just allow yourself to surrender into that space of trust and just really, really, you know, that self-love and knowing that you're okay, it's going to be okay. I mean, the way the whole entire world opens up is just phenomenal. You know, but you just said something really, I think really important. And, and that is like around self-love. And I don't, I know for myself, I couldn't access any self-love at, at that point. And I, I don't know, I think I still have to work on it. Now I think I'm awesome. I don't know if anyone else thinks that, but I think I'm, I think my dog thinks I'm pretty awesome. But anyway, um, I don't know. It's not that easy to access self-love, but what it's more, um, I think what I've learned and, and I do this with my clients and we know this, we know this now from an energetic place that when we try to push away that yucky feeling, it amplifies. You would think logically that it would go away, but it doesn't. When we can somehow kind of lean into it. And so I work in the world, if you were out of my profession, is around business development and growing your business and branding. But what most people do is they don't want to look at yucky stuff. But when we start to look at the yucky stuff, there's actually all sorts of good, like seeds in there. There's the seeds of greatness in all the yuckiness, you know? Like we were talking about it early, like what do we use for fertilizer people? We use manure, we use, you know, it's crazy. But that, if you think of yourself as this beautiful seed that's been planted in this muck, we will then, we have to, there's this, it's so hard to trust, but if we can trust ourselves and if we can trust the process, which, Honestly, I don't know how we do, and I think we don't. But if we kind of even seesaw back and forth, if we see a glimmer, if we have a knowing, like there's a piece of you that knows that you are awesome. There's a piece of you somewhere that gets that you're not like anybody else. And that's cool. That's awesome. Like our whole world is all about fitting in and we're not meant to fit in. We're meant to stand out. We're meant to be different. And I think in this relentless pursuit of fitting in, we're cheating ourselves. And I can tell you so many stories about not fitting in. Um, yeah, and now, and now I'm so proud of it. Like, I'm so grateful that I never figured that out. But you know, when you're in it, it, it doesn't, it's not pretty. And it's not pretty now, guess what? I've, you know, supposedly grown up. I'm still working on that, but. Um, <laughs> It, it, you know, there are times when it does not feel good to be a weirdo. And there are other times when I just wouldn't, I, I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when you're, when you're a child in school or a young adult in school and this need of wanting to fit in because you, you, 
just don't know any other way to be because of the pressure that you get. And I, for a lot of kids, they will become more introverted and they'll pull back and yeah. they'll move away instead of really getting engaged. And I know, um, you know, for, for myself personally, the way that my unconventional childhood was, I mean, the bullying was re relentless because, you know, it wasn't a traditional kind of household in the sense of how my peers were growing up. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of things they could pick on me for <laughs> because I definitely didn't fit in for a lot of reasons. <laughs> and, but, you know, when I look at all of that, at that time, it, it did feel very, very uncomfortable. And I agree with you to the advice of if I were to give myself advice, it would be, you, you know, seek out someone who could support you, but then also support yourself knowing you're okay and know, know that it will be okay because it really will. Um, but then you also have, you know, this other side where you're, you're taking on projections of your environment. So for me, I didn't really have too much of that exposure, but I know you did. You had a different experience, so you had a lot of projections. And maybe you could talk a little bit about how that affected you and what it did. Well, you know, it's interesting. I just want to make a comment about what something that you just said, because I think it's really important. And one of the things um, that I really enjoy in doing um, or being a having an awareness around now is something I call distinctions, right? So the distinction that you just brought up. And so this is, my request is that we, um, that we get a little more curious and inquisitive about ourselves and our world. I find that to be very helpful um, and also just interesting. And, I, and anyway, so what you just brought up um, is very interesting to me because it's, there's a distinction between fitting in and like being normal, which is what the heck is that anyway, normal, and then uh, being validated. So being validated is very different than fitting in or being normal, right? Being validated is having someone and I, I don't know how you find this person. And believe me, I didn't when I was little. Um, but it's really having someone, they don't have to get you. They don't have to like you. They don't have to know you. But they can validate that, you know, what you're experiencing, what you've done, what you've said, how you're showing up, like that it's, it has merit, which is very different from fitting in. Fitting in is being like everyone else. Fitting in is wearing the same clothes and listening to the same music and, you know, like playing the same games or, you know, use, doing your Instagram page like everybody else's or whatever, you know, do, learning the dance on TikTok. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that, whether it's like when I was young, we didn't have the computers. And so I was, I love to read. Um, I was a terrible reader when I was super little, but once I got it, I really got it and I loved it. And so I would stay home. My parents would go out on a Saturday night and I would stay home and read biographies. And I would read about twins and, and I didn't know this at the time, energy and extra, extraterrestrials and aliens. And I loved all that stuff. And that's how I really kind of comforted myself, right? Is because I found these places that I could relate to. Um, but it's really more, and that helps me to validate myself. I don't know if this is making any sense, which is different from being invited to a party that I was not invited to or wearing this, you know, the, the cool clothes, which I didn't, uh, whatever it was that would have me this external validation. It's more like, how can I be me? And somebody somewhere, including myself says, you know what? That was kind of cool. Yeah, you. Does that I, make sense? It makes sense in the sense that you were seeking yourself out and that showed up in a different variety of ways. So for you, just gravitating towards something that was calling, calling you in the sense of learning more about yourself, it just validated that part of you that you were connecting with. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes perfect sense. Yes, yes, yes. So that quest 
to me, if I was speaking to someone else, I would say to me that I would think, I would suggest, please go there because this um, quest to be like everyone else, it's not gonna have the same payoff. It's not gonna serve you now or later in the same way that being validated for who you be is perfect. You know, I was telling you the story kind of um, is in the same vein about clients who say, you know, oh, I, I know I, I dream too much and I this too much and I that too much. And no, it's all part of you. I, I want you to be more of you, not less of you. Like, how can you be more of you? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, earlier I was um, asking about your environment and some of the impact of your environment and how we, how we take that on and what we do with it. Um, I know yeah. when, when we're young, we don't have the ability to control what is happening within our environment. And sometimes the, the yeah. adults that are in our life, they're do, everybody's doing the best they can, but the adults in our life don't fully recognize the impact that they can have mm -hmm. on a child or young person. Yeah. It, and I don't think it's just like, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about all these different instances. So, you know, there was school and there was home. And then I was forced to go to camp. I hated camp. Um, you know, I, I was I was pushed. And, and then when you think about it as an adult, you know, that happens to us as an adult too. We may work in an environment where we feel odd. We may, we, we may not, we may do a presentation and be laughed at. We may have an idea that someone else who poos we may think we are more qualified for a promotion. We may start a business that doesn't work. I mean, there's a million ways that it shows up all day, all the time. So um, I think the difference is that when we're younger, we don't have the tools because we haven't been on earth long enough to have any tools. <laughs> you know, we're just trying to make it to lunch, um, you know? And, um, and so for me, that was the difference is uh, my life radically changed when I did my first personal development course. Now, I'm a very big advocate for bringing some of these, now we call them soft skills, but an emotional intelligence and all that sort of stuff. To me, there's nothing more valuable because the more that we can access these sorts of pieces of ourselves, the more likely we are to be able to navigate any of those toxic environments with greater ease and with some um, like inner fortitude that we may not have had previously, like it really is your armor rather than this armor being um, to be angry or to cry all the time or, or to get into addiction or to get, you know, whatever, um, you know, we think about um, boys in our culture and how much anger there is in, in men. And, you know, part of it is chemical part of it, you know, there's just, the part of it is the food we eat that has weird stuff in it that does strange stuff to our body. I mean, there's, this is a very endless conversation, but I think for anybody, you know, rather than um, this piece of like, what can you do or where can you go or what can you learn? It's more like, how can you access inner peace? How can you access the part of you that you inherently, intuitively, heartfully know is good. And it doesn't have to be something that, you know, is gonna make you into a movie star or a, a, a basketball court genius or a zillion dollar person. It, it's, when I say that, I mean that you have pieces of yourself that you know are beautiful and valuable. And so how can you fan those flames? You know, is it working with other people? Is it helping, is it tutoring other kids that are littler than you? Is it reading, you know, what is it? What is it? We all have it. And, and, I, and that's something that I think our society, because we're in this like rough and tumble survival place these days that we've really lost touch with, that we are all, all, old enough to contribute. If you're watching this and you're, and this is sinking in at any level, then you're old enough. That's all you need to know. And I, I think that in the times that we're living right now and the discomfort that people are feeling, 
we are in this evolutionary spiritual shift and people that are parents or, you know, young adults that are trying to find their way and even adults that are still, you know, not certain of the direction they're going. Yeah. I I think this is a, a, a blessing in a sense that it allows everyone on the planet to take pause and really evaluate that inward space within them. And when you're, when you're a child, literally that's, you're, you're, you don't have any layers to shed. So the authenticity of you is at its purest form in that moment. So if, you know, you're that, that little kid that's constantly dissecting bugs and fascinated with, you know, biology, you might be growing up to be a doctor, or if you're that little girl who wants to teach and you're teaching the teddy bears with a blackboard and ABCs and all that, you know, maybe your calling is to be a teacher. But there's, there's so many things that happen along the way where, to your point, those natural gifts are being squashed and shut down. And I think part of it is the disservice that society places in the sense that we're not going to highlight your natural talents. We're going to, we're going to make you perfect in everything or we're going to create this benchmark that you have to be perfect in everything. But that's not how people work. Yeah. That's not how people work. We yeah. all have we <clears throat> all have these peaks and valleys and it's a matter of accentuating the peaks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of that. I don't, I can't speak this correctly because I can't remember exactly how to say it, but it's something about, <clears throat> you know, a fish can swim really perfectly, but if you ask them to climb a tree, that's, that's going to be a problem. <clears throat> so, you know, we have to all find our little fishbowl. And, um, and I, I think one of the other things, and, and I don't know, I, I don't have kids, I guess, because I'm still a kid. But I think that um, one of the things that's very challenging when you're a kid is we feel, and I don't think as adults, we trust kids to do this for themselves, is we don't really create, for most of us, we don't create the space to figure out or to find out or to lean into what you really enjoy. And that's when I think one of the blessings of homeschooling, I think in this era is, again, I think there's a gap between um, playing outside all day and then really, how do you then translate it into really understanding some of these softer skills that relate to uh, how you can parlay any of your talents into adulthood. But, you know, whether it's reading or whether it's, Um, other forms of play. I just think there's other ways for us to investigate and lean into. I call it your fabulosity. And I promise you that everyone has fabulosity. You may not think you do, but you do. It just takes a really, it's horribly painful. You know, I was thinking the other day, I don't know if this is appropriate, but (laughs) wouldn't it be interesting if we did do life backwards? Like I have Mm. a mom who's melting. So she's becoming like a baby. But what if that was the beginning and not the end? Because on both ends, we're like babies, right? So what if then when you got to be 11, you had all of this collected wisdom from when you were 85 and 75 and 65? Like, wouldn't it be interesting? Because when you're 11 and you can run and play and jump and scream and climb and stuff that, you know, now I'd like to do, but I'm not so good at. (laughs) Um, or I don't have the stamina for whatever but like when you're 15 and you have all this energy but then you also had all this smarts like wow wouldn't that be fun like what would life be like then and then we'd be saying wow it's so it's so sad when you're 75 and life is so hard and so you know it's kind of like that Benjamin Button thing but not that you're getting younger but that you have this wisdom and you it's it'll be a whole different game So just know that we don't have this understanding. And, you know, it's kind of like we were talking about this the other day in another group. 
Like when people say life goes fast, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, go, yeah, whatever, dude, goes fast, yeah, whatever. It really does. Shh, it really does. Yeah. And and so like you know today you're you're 15 or you're 10 and it's awful and like that you're gonna be 45. <laughs> so it's it's so true. It goes super super fast and. You know, the beauty of the beginning of life and really the end of life is this freedom, this freedom that you have from the chains that bind as far as, you know, mm -hmm. the sense of you mm -hmm. have to be in a certain, I don't know, hamster wheel, right? Just to survive and that kind of thing. And that's all gone. Like when you're a child, you have this freedom where yeah. you can just be your authentic self and do the things that you want to do. And even though you don't have control over, you know, your environment, because you have parents that are controlling a lot of that space for you. I think it's really important to understand that there is this sense of control that you have over yourself, like your own personal mm -hmm. self. And I think that's something that 2020 is really bringing out for everybody. It's just recognizing that, you know, even for kids, like there is this sense of control that you can have personal responsibility mm -hmm. over going into your inner self and working in that space. <clears throat> yeah. And, and you're bringing up something also, I think, really important, which is Yes, we don't have control over our environments per se, and but there, uh, but we, what we do have control of, and and I, if you had told me this, I would not have. I don't think I would have understood it, believed it, or known how to do it. But um, because we start to believe what we're being, what people are saying about us. So, it, if you can somehow access that part of you that you know is like okay or good or fabulous. Instead of buying into what other people say, you know, I was telling Catherine a story when we, before we got on air about um, something that happened to me when I was little and it didn't, that my mom was always yelling at me. And finally, and it, it took me when I was in university. So it was a thousand years later. And I said, what are you, why are you yelling at me? It doesn't make any sense. Like I haven't talked to you. <laughs> how could you be mad at me? I haven't even talked to you. And she just sort of said, oh, I, I, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at your dad. And I realized that all those years, all those yelling, all that screaming, all that throwing verbal stuff at me, as well as other things, had nothing to do with me. It was all because she was mad at dad and she felt cheated or neglected or whatever, or invalidated herself. She didn't feel seen. She didn't feel heard. And so she was yelling and taking that out on me. And that was just like this gigantic awakening. Like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You're telling me now at 20 something like that had nothing to do with me. And I've been internalizing that all this time. Yeah. And that's what we, that's what we do. We're humans. We're, it's called imprinting, right? For a reason it's being imprinted. And so how do we resist that? That, that's the big question. And, and we can, that is an inside job. It really is. It really is. And, they, and I think it takes time to undo it, like you said, because when you're young, you don't have the ability or the cognitive ability to really decipher what the reality is of your world. And when you get older and you have this new level of awareness and you look back, you start to put pieces together and then you start to recognize that in and I, I will not say in all cases, but in most cases, the people that are raising you are really doing the best they can. They are, and, yeah. And this is where no matter what your circumstances are, they really are doing the best they can. And yeah. it can negatively impact you, but if you can find it within yourself to have the capacity to show forgiveness and grace, yeah. you will release yourself of, those binds that, you know, tie you into a negative headspace as far as your relationship. And I think Absolutely. a lot of people struggle with that. <clears throat> I did. Yeah. I, I did not, if you had told me that, oh gosh, I, I, I think I would have looked at you like you were from either another planet or on some strange drugs, 
because that didn't to have compassion for people who seemed so lacking in that arena. Um, yeah, it just was, it was super confusing, super confusing. But yeah, it, it I, I literally, as this is, might sound a little crazy, but I literally remember exactly where I was when I had that aha moment that they were doing the best they could. And it really, and I was, I was well into my twenties and um, it really was like a, like, like a, it's like somebody smacked me upside the head. Like, 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 how could that be the best that they could do? Like, they're smart. And they, they grew up well, and they went to university. And, you know, like, it didn't seem like logically that, that this would be the case. But indeed, it was like, you know, parents are not given a book, they are, do not go to classes, they do not, they are just winging it. And some of them do really well. And most of them don't. <laughs> it's just yeah. what it is. And that doesn't mean that they don't love you. And that doesn't mean that they're not doing their best. It's just that their best can look very bizarre. <laughs> I, I have to laugh because I can totally relate. You know? <laughs> so. Yeah. And I remember having that feeling and it was just like, oh my goodness, you're kidding me. Like that's what, that's what they thought was a good idea. Yikes. But yeah, they, they really did. Yeah. And, you know, and as you, as you go through life and you start to pick up on the little things that you're experiencing, you, you do have the compassion and ability to look back and say, okay, this is where they were. This is what they were experiencing, but then they had these multiple layers on it and their vision on it was also different because of the times that they were in or the circumstances they were going through. There's a lot of different layers to it. But I think when you're able to separate it out and really recognize, compartmentalize it and recognize that that is the case, it does allow that release. And when you have that release and you surrender to it, your vision on the world completely shifts. Like you said, it's like you get smacked with a brick wall or something. And you're just like, okay, I get this now. I can, I can actually do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always feel like it's like you were standing in this really dark room and somebody turns on the light and you're like, oh, it was dark in here. Oh, I didn't even know it was dark in here, but gosh, it was really dark. No wonder I was bumping into everything. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, I think one of the things that the, the world we're in right now, people are really uncomfortable with change. They're uncomfortable with the growth that is, you know, happening with this shift that people are, this phenomenal shift mm -hmm. that people are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And to your point, I mean, part of what you shared with us earlier, you know, was that you were in this dark space and, you know, you had talked about a little bit about, um, feeling like, you know, your dream of getting into an accident was something that you, you know, wanted to see to fruition. And thankfully that didn't happen. Um, but I, I would just, you know, say to the audience, if anybody's listening and they're suicidal, please, you know, reach out to your community for that support and make sure that you're getting the support you need and, you know, so that you're safe and you're okay. But um, I mean, a lot of times when we are in these uncomfortable situations. I mean, we do have these moments where we feel the weakness and we feel the darkness coming over and it's almost like, okay, my, my cage is rattled, I'm, I'm rattled. Um, I mean, for you, like what, what kind of reverse that around for you? Oh gosh. So I didn't, there was there for a long time there wasn't a particular incident I really was just continuing to bumble along and be really sad and spend many hours crying and very much in darkness and I would go to work uh, work was kind of a place that saved me as I grew older and because um, I had to pretend I was functional and I would get in my car and cry and, uh, you know, there was, it, it was just a, sort of a long story. And it wasn't like I, this was all day, every day, but it, it was a struggle. It was a challenge. And then um, as I grew older, I knew some people that had taken this personal development class and they kept asking me to do it too. And I, I didn't understand like why, 
I mean, I, I, and I would say goofy things because I'm very hard on my friends. Like, I love you to pieces, but you seem the same to me. And <laughs> I don't really get it. And uh, I just didn't, I didn't understand. And they say, oh my God, I just did this thing. was so incredible, you got it. And I didn't understand. And um, I ended up going to university in Colorado and I stayed out there for about a decade. And I married a boy I met in school and uh, I expected him and my expectation of him was to bring me happy and make me happy. And every day I would wait to say like, honey, I'm home and I brought you some happy and he never did. And I just couldn't understand that. And we finally divorced and it was just this very long drawn out painful search. It was like this endless search. And finally uh, I ended up moving to New York city and I did, I ended up moving to New York city in time for uh, New Year's Eve. I planned it. So my first night in New York city would be New Year's Eve. And I went to this party and it was a party with all these people who had gone to this course that I kept saying, no, thank you. And not so nicely, thank you, no, thank you. And um, I met this guy and the guy ended up speaking to me in a, such a way that was so, it was so thought provoking and he kind of pushed all the right buttons and said all the right things and was like, I can see how powerful, you, I, I, was it a line? Was it not a line? I, I don't know, he was married. He wasn't like hitting on me kind of that kind of conversation, but it was a very, I like deep conversation. I find that just fascinating. I can talk about the stars forever. I just, I just love going deep with people. I don't really want to talk about the weather, but I, I would love to talk about this stuff anyway. So he, um, he finally, he said to me, now he knew I had just moved there that night. <laughs> he said to me, Oh, what are you doing? Like February 4th. It's like, I'm a terrible liar. Like, well, are you kidding me? Like, how do I lie about I'm busy on February 4th when I moved here three seconds ago? <laughs> I said, oh, I'm not doing anything. Um, so he invited me to come to his home and to hear this pitch about this course. And I finally did sign up for the course. I, I was also very sassy pants <laughs> to the people up there. And, and yet it's just all the stars aligned. And this is, I think what happens is that there's these weird collisions of perfection that point you in a particular direction. And I don't know why I've always followed my heart and I was just like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And it, it, it literally changed my life on a weekend. It really did. And I realized, and this may sound really silly, but it's what happened. Um, I realized that I was choosing this dark place and I had it had become so familiar and it had become my default way of being does this make sense and I was so as icky as it was it was also comfortable and I just I don't really know how to explain it but I realized that I could choose I know this is going to sound crazy I realized I could choose something else but blaming my parents, blaming whoever didn't invite me to the party. And I, when I didn't have the right sweater and like, I, you know, the lit, the teacher that said, blah, blah, blah. And whatever it was, right. Whatever it was, I could blame all of that. Or I could put all of that over here and I could just say, you know what? I'm choosing to be happy now. Now I don't mean that I, overnight I was happy, but it was a launch pad. And it was a shift, just like we just said, like when I realized my parents were doing the best they could, it was just like this, oh, what? Like I have an option. I'm choosing sadness and depression. I'm choosing that. Hmm. I, well, yes, sir, I was. <laughs> and that you know, was just major. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because when we're young, we have adults making these decisions for us. And we lose our ability to recognize that we are able to choose. So the fact that you, you get to this moment in life and it could take you, you know, 13 years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever it is. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, I get it now. I actually have control over this. And I agree with you. There's I have talked to so many people and if there were an underlying theme, 
it profoundly is that word you get to choose, you know, choice. Choice is the word because you do Huge. get to choose and it is, it's powerful. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm such an advocate. I mean, I, this is a whole other conversation that you and I didn't even touch on, but I really feel strongly that we are doing our kids a, such a disservice because by the time you're 14, 15, like maybe 11, I think is too young, but by the time you're a teenager, it's really time to start making these distinctions. Like this is something that is being done to you. This is, yes, you have to live here. Yes, this is what you're having for dinner. But there are other places that we are choosing all the time. And we don't, we're not aware of it and we're blaming it on everybody else. And um, I don't, I mean, think of the impact of helping people when you're 14 or 15 ish to make your own choices. And I had very controlling parents, very. So my, I, my decision-making muscles still are not great. They're rather weak. I'm still working on them. But if we um, empowered people rather than disempowering people starting when you're younger and we developed their emotional intelligence so that their ability to choose and weigh and decide and discern was much greater. Wow, think of the world we would create. Think of the brilliance that would be evoked. Think of the, like, do grownups not do that because they're scared? Like, what's keeping the adult population from empowering younger people? I don't get it. And this, yeah. I could go on a whole, we, we could talk for another three days about that. <laughs> But, um, but I do think that whether that is available to you or not, to know, to, to tap into, to start to take that piece back for yourself or to take that piece away for yourself or to start being curious about that for yourself. Like, hmm, is, cause I remember being, and I think I was in my thirties and um, I realized that I was behaving um, about something that it wasn't even me. It was totally my mom. It wasn't even like who I be. Like I am not someone who gets mad, who holds a grudge. I mean, I, yes, I get mad. Yes, I can hold a grudge, but I, the way that my family and that my was being taught to be, part of the discomfort was because it wasn't me. Those wouldn't have been my choices. And when I started to be able to step back and choose again, and say, wait a minute, is this really my choice or did I learn this from somebody else? It started yeah. to change everything. Yeah, and that's powerful because the que that question, did I learn this from somebody else, is so powerful. I mean, because you're really going back to, is it your truth? Is it your authentic space and is it your truth? Yeah. So that that's really amazing. I mean, if you had any... Uh, words of wisdom for people of the world right now? I mean, what would it be? You have any, any mm -hmm. insight onto to uh, tools or something mm -hmm. that would be helpful to them? I, I don't know. I, I mean, what shows up for me a lot, often and a lot, and, and now in particular, is um, I have to keep reminding myself as well as others that all is well. You know, there's a concept in the coaching world called um, the present is perfect. So sometimes I think we all have to look at this through this lens of if this is all happening for me, not to me, if this is perfect, then what? You know, if instead of pushing against this is messed up and it shouldn't be like this and why me, right? If we can take that armor off because when we're looking there we it, it, the, the you can't it's not even in your ability to see that but if you can come from this place of um, everything you know it's all perfect all is well so now how do I integrate what is happening we oftentimes will come up with other outcomes and other options and other possibilities. So that's a big piece of what I remind myself and I help other people look at too, because when we start looking there, we actually find amazing, amazing answers. And some of them make people a lot of money. 
And some of them make people a lot more happy. And yeah. some of them just make people a lot more peaceful. Absolutely does. And I, I, like everything you just said, I mean, it's just, I wish I could replay it exactly the way you just said it, because I think everybody needs to hear it twice. I mean, it's beautiful. But um, I thank you so much for being with me and having this conversation. I mean, it's it's been a delight and there's so much that you've offered to the world as far as your insight and your ability to see it through a different lens. And, you know, you're just, you're just a beautiful human and you have a beautiful spirit and way about you that the way you communicate, it's just very joyful. And, you know, even those difficult topics, you like bring this energy to it that makes it easier to to digest. So I really appreciate oh. that. Oh, I hope I was helpful to someone somewhere. Absolutely. And I do ask all of my speakers, if I were to find your earth angel feather on the ground and I were to pick it up, what would your message to the world be? Mm. Well, it probably would be along those lines, but I think at the heart of it, the message is that you matter and that you are special and that um, the future is, is very bright. But it is up to us to step into that. Yeah. Yeah. And you get to make that decision and choice. Yeah. 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 Because when you decide that, then you're, you're, you're looking under different rocks and you're, you're finding other things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so thank grateful you. that you were here with me sharing this space. So I, I appreciate it so much. Thank you. So that's all we have time for today. This is Catherine Daniels with Retreat to Peace, reminding you to live your authentic life with peace. And as always, retreat to peace. And we'll see you next time.